In the last episode, you saw me in Buchanan County, Virginia, near Grundy. Thoughts of progress, the passage of time, and just who's keeping old-timey Appalachian traditions alive today were all on my mind. One such keeper of those traditions is a modern-day blacksmith right here in southwest Virginia. Let me introduce him to you. Steel's kind of one of those substances that people look at and think, you know, only God can move that. It's almost a religious experience sometimes. Get lost in your work and days out and just go on autopilot and have that connection. I'm not saying it's church, but it's pretty darn close for me. I'm Joshua Langfitt. Uh, I'm a full-time blacksmith here in Southwest Virginia. Especially if there is such a thing for me, uh, I kind of specialize in 18th century living history. Um, I do get to play with some cannons because of that and, and making hardware and fixtures for them. I got started when I was 16 as a blacksmith, so that makes me about uh, close to 25 years of experience under my belt now. I got started because my father handed me a fantasy novel. The main character made a sword using meteorite and a volcano for a heat source. I cried BS on that. Uh, he sent me to the library to do some work research-wise on it. Found out, yes, I lost a bet in doing so, but uh, I did find out that you can do it. It's not very comfortable. And unless you're a demigod like the main character was, or wearing PPE specialized for it, you're gonna die. I lost the bet with my dad, wound up splitting wood for the winter. Uh, buy my onesie and found out some information. One, I could do this using what's called a primitive African ground forge uh, and how to set that up. So I did. I, I set up a little fire pit with some tunnels coming off to another hole in the ground. Uh, the diagram showed using animal skins. I'm not on the African plains, I'm gonna use an inner tube. I used a piece of inner tube stretched out over that. You step and up and down on it, and it pushes and pulls the air through, back and forth. Uh, blows better than it sucks, but uh, it worked. Uh, I was able to heat up a piece of black iron pipe and make a katana-shaped object out of it uh, because zero metallurgical skills at this state. Um, I broke it against a peach tree. Uh, which peach trees are pretty soft wood. Uh, so you can imagine the quality of work it was. The anvil I used was actually the, the camshaft out of a semi. So if you're looking to get started, don't get hung up on an anvil shape. All you need is mass. Um, and that's probably the, the best thing I can say is don't get hung up on the traditional shapes of things and what they really started out as. You can do it as simple or as complex as you really want. You just kind of do like I did and start simple and work your way up to some of the more complex stuff, like an anvil or a post vise or uh, an oxygen tank cut and torch system set up, you know, uh, all the way to a plasma cutter. So it just depends on your, where you're at and, and remember to stay humble and start small. After I got started in this and, and a few years after I got married and moved out to Virginia, uh, my father started doing some of the, the genealogical work uh, for his side of the family. And he found a blacksmith a couple of great grandfathers back who actually was a full-time blacksmith uh, right around the, the time where they started transitioning from horse and buggy to cars. Uh, so it was a two-story shop up up top uh, at ground floor, they, uh, they dealt with the automobiles and, and starting with that. Down behind in the, the rear of the hill, that's where he had the actual blacksmith's work where they worked on refurbishing uh, horse and buggy. They did all the farrier work there and the, the buggy work. This craft is actually a very strong passion for me, obviously with 25 years and, and most of that being hobby. Um, about five and a half years experience of that time frame has actually been full time. Uh, I do have a large family. Uh, we're a family of nine and it's been able to support us make ends meet and pay the bills. A few reasons why I love this craft. 
Uh, one of them probably being the fact that I'm allowed to hit something and not go to jail for it. Um, I can get it red hot, smack the ever-living fire out of it, and uh, it doesn't scream. That uh, side of things lets you have a lot of cathartic uh, use there. You're, you're able to get some of your frustrations out on the work. Two, my second reason, uh, you know, steel's kind of one of those substances that people look at and think, you know, only God can move that. So it gives you kind of that sense, that tie back to uh, divinity. Uh, it's almost a religious experience sometimes. You kind of can get lost in your work and days out and just go on autopilot and, and have that connection. Uh, I'm not saying it's a church, but it's pretty darn close for me sometimes. Generally, uh, the projects that I do most recently have been a lot of architectural ironwork. Uh, bath hooks, towel hooks, hand, hand bars coming down, stair rails, stuff like that. Um, but that's one half of it, and the other half is custom blades. Um, one of my favorite projects to date have been some Chinese Dao swords that I made for, for some student uh, martial artists. Uh, and those things, just to put it simply and to steal somebody else's tagline, they will keel. Uh, <laughs> so, going from a historic standpoint, a lot of the materials used would be repurposed. Um, if you're going along, even nowadays, if you're going along and, and your leaf springs break or your shocks break, um, it's usually got a carbon metal material in that. In leaf springs, that's very similar to 5160 high carbon steel. That makes a tremendous blade. Very, very nice, very versatile. It's easy to heat treat. Uh, it has an attitude when you work it, so you have to work it at a higher heat. Um, otherwise, it will beat you back. Some of the old timers would repurpose wagon rims, tire rims. Uh, it's a wrought iron material, so it's very, very forgiving in its usage. Again, it's kind of like a plate of wet noodles. When you work it, you have to actually work it at a high welding temperature and can consistently condense it back in on itself. But it's very easy to shape. Most of the modern architectural ironwork that I use, my material is actually a mild steel. However, at the same time, I have a lot of folks that uh, bring me salvaged material. I've got mechanics that will bring me cable, um, coil springs, leaf spring, you know, stuff like that, car axle, jackhammer bits. Yeah, they make good knives too. Uh, the one problem with a lot of those impact things is they have a, a real hard life. They usually break for a reason. They have stress cracks through them. Uh, so you have to be mindful of some of those hidden elements that you can't see with your naked eye unless you heat it up and bend it and then they'll show themselves. There are some trade-offs. Uh, you do have to learn, I guess, a little bit of the material science behind some of the modern steels before you start scrapping material. Or you just do like I did and trial and error it, probably more along the historic lines of the old smiths and first getting on their feet on the ground. They, they used what they had. You know, if, uh, if the sawmill broke the blade, they'd use that blade as a source for high carbon steel and make knives out of it. Um, they'd use some wagon rims, forge weld them together, make hammers, and then take some of that uh, saw blade material to make the face on it in, in a process called stealing. Um, same thing for the axes. The old axes were wrought iron bodies with a tool steel face or bit put onto it. You know, it's, if you know what you're working with, it makes life a lot easier as a smith. Uh, along the lines of the living history exhibits that I work with, I work with two museums, uh, Smithfield Plantation in Blacksburg and the Wilderness Trail Museum uh, out in New Bern, Virginia. Uh, they, uh, they do actually, you know, it's volunteer based, so there's not just me that's there, there are other reenactors, other artisans and craftsmen that work out of these areas. Uh, I do hold some classes there at those places, but a lot of what I do when I'm there is education on a historic setup.
if they have barn doors, I'll be making barn door strap hinges, uh, pentels that will hold those things in place. It's actually a project I've got going out at Newburn. Uh, door latches, gate hinges, all kinds of little tiny knickknacks. Because historically speaking, your blacksmith was a was not a specialist. Historically speaking, 18th century in particular, um, frontier times, you had to be a scattergun, as it were. You had to have a little bit of everything to be able to um, fit in the needs for your the people in the area you were at. Anything from making needles all the way up to pots and pans, mending, uh, the cranes for the fireplaces when they're building the homes, all the way down to the nails. It's, it's all going to be touched by a blacksmith. Any craft actually had to have involvement with a blacksmith. Your seamstress would have scissors and needles made by the blacksmith. Your woodcutters, all their tools come from the blacksmith. Axes, adzes, draw knives, you know, furniture makers getting more, you know, nitty gritty and finer detail tools. It all went through a blacksmith's hands. I illustrate that point quite a bit when I'm out at these rendezvous and you know, reenactment sessions and whatnot. Some of the other tedious things, or meticulous things rather, are forming the, the eyes on some of these tools, like, like the fro that we're making. Uh, it tapers in one direction. You have to make sure you're consistent in that taper uh, and that it doesn't become one long tube. You actually have to make sure you keep that taper in there. There are a lot of things for uses with a fro. The fro use, uh, historically speaking, we know it was used for making kindling, for, for doing shingles. I suspect, looking at some of the, the rail fencings, that it was also used in their manufacture. It's a whole lot easier, I think, to, to come down and split down the length of a log, or quarter it even, uh, with a fro than it is to, to work five or six wedges in there and, and try and split it out that way. But, uh, you know, there's a lot of different things you can use a fro for. It's a very common tool uh, out on the frontier, specifically during, you know, the settlement time eras. It's a lot of fun. It's a lot of different stuff. Um, if you specialize, you can become a super master at one thing, or you can get pretty good at a whole bunch of things by being a generic frontier smith. So the three rules that I always heard, um, particularly about moonshine, but any flammable substance that uh, can be consumed. Never drink it near an open flame. You try not to let it hit your gums on the way down, and it's a wee touch stronger than the horse piss you all drink over here called whiskey. Most common ways of getting a hold of me to, to get stuff is one, in person at a demo. Uh, anytime I'm at the museums, uh, folks can have come up and, and do come up and ask me about that. Uh, most of what I do is word of mouth. So it's, it's through Facebook, it's through social media like Instagram, both of those I have. Um, you can find me at JJL Forge under either of those. Uh, and I do, I am working on building a website. So in the future, you'll be able to get a hold of me through there.